ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends, <clears throat> on behalf of the Center for Liberal Modernity and our Ukrainian partners, I would like to welcome you all very warmly, especially our guests from Ukraine. We are glad to have you with us, at least virtually. You are joining us while your cities are being devastated. Millions of, of people are fleeing and your country is fighting a heroic battle against the Russian war of aggression. We deeply admire your courage. You are fighting not only for yourselves, you are also fighting for us. And it's our historical duty to support you with all what we can. And this is what today's event is about. Originally, we planned a conference on the strategic energy partnership between Germany, the European Union and Ukraine. And we will catch up on this project when the time has come to make plans for a common future again. And this time will come. Now we, Germany, the European Union, the West must do everything we can to ensure that Ukraine will survive as a free nation and an independent state. Putin's war must fail once and for all. We will focus on two issues today. The first part of our discussion is about the devastation this war is wreaking, what human casualties and what material destruction have Russian troops caused so far, and what can the European Union, what can Germany do now in terms of humanitarian, technical, financial emergency aid to mitigate the devastation of this war. In the second part of our conversation, we will ask what else Germany and the European Union can and must do to help Ukraine resisting the Russian aggression. Key topics for this discussion will be, of course, arms supplies for Ukraine, a clear prospect of accession to the European Union, and tighter sanctions against Russia to deprive Putin of the resources for his war. We'll start now um, with uh, the first round. Olga <coughs> Stefanishina, the uh, Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine, had uh, to cancel on short notice due to an emergency government meeting. And we are very glad that Ambassador Yevgen Perligin, uh, the head of the office of the Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration, will give us a current overview uh, on uh, the situation in Ukraine and the human and material losses in this uh, war. And then Michael Siebert, the Managing Director Eastern Europe and Central Asia of the European External Action Service will respond with the EU perspective on the war and the European Union's uh, policies towards Ukraine. Please have in mind that we have uh, not more than 45 minutes for this uh, first session. Um, we will have some space for, for questions and answers before we then move to the second part of uh, our webinar. Please, Yevgen, uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to convey the strongest uh, message of thanks uh, on behalf of Olga Stefanishina, Vice Prime Minister, and uh, thank for unprecedented support uh, and assistance uh, from our European uh, and transatlantic uh, partners. Uh, I would like to give you uh, or to divide my information in two parts, as you suggested right now, uh, first operational information and then humanitarian situation uh, up to now. Uh, today is the 27th uh, day of the Ukrainian people's uh, heroic resistance to Russian full-scale military uh, invasion. And being ambassador in many European uh, countries, uh, including one which my president uh, addressed uh, right now today, uh, I could never imagine that I will give to my European partners 
so sad and terrible information. The cost of the war is thousands dead, million, millions refugees and IDPs. Kharkiv, Mariupol, Chernigov, Akhtyrka are in the ruins. 100 billions in infrastructure damage and counting. Russia fired until now 1,000 missiles at residential areas and military positions, attacks with aviation, tanks, and artillery, and sends super and reconnaissance groups. Russian warships shell the coast line. Ukraine's coast of the Azov Sea now is temporarily blocked by Russians. A Russia Black Sea fleet is mining the Black Sea at least at the Danube mouth and near Ismail and Zmiini Island. Mining the area near Zmiini Island uh, means blocking the traffic flow for merchant ships that goes from Bosphorus in the direction of Odessa along the coast of Turkey, Romania, Bulgaria, and Ukraine. Russia actively uses air advantage by attacking military positions and civilian objects, killing dozens of civilians daily, bombing Ukrainian infrastructure. Therefore, we urgently need to close the sky. If you cannot help us with this, please give us air defense systems and fighter jets. Ukrainian people deserve the chance to survive. Every day of hesitation and talking and talking just shows Putin he is leading this uh, terrible game. No one greets Russia in Ukraine. In these towns temporarily under control of Russian troops, for example, in the south, Kherson, Melitopol and others, Ukrainian population is actively protesting against them. One another very important fact, Russia's irresponsible actions pose the gravest nuclear threat. On 4th or much for the entire Europe was put on the brink of nuclear disaster when the Russian troops began shelling the largest in Europe, Zaporizhia, nuclear power plant. I would say that Russia violates international law. One example, March 11th, the United Nations OS H. CHR confirmed the use of cluster munitions by Russian troops in populated areas. Russian actions constitute war crimes without any doubts. Troops terrorize the civilian population, killings, torture, raping of women. This is terror Russia army borrowed to Ukraine. The sanctions are important. International pressure, sanctions and isolation of Russia is important for the negotiations, future negotiations with Russia. This pressure should increase as long as Russia continues to commit war crimes in Ukraine. Some words about humanitarian situation, but before I would say that we are very grateful to the European Union uh, for support to Ukraine. Yesterday, EU foreign ministers made an important decision to give Ukraine another a half billion in arms and military equipment. The European Commission disbursed a 600 million in emergency microfinancial assistance. This is a meaningful contribution towards enhancing Ukraine's macroeconomic stability. However, with each day of Russian armed aggressions, the humanitarian situation is rapidly deteriorating. Residents of uh, besides cities and villages 
have to live in basements without electricity, gas, or heating, without water. They lack food also. And delivery of humanitarian aid is blocked to constant shelling by Russians. The worst situation remains in the city of Mariupol. The real number of killed and wounded civilians can be horrifying. Almost 90% of the city's infrastructure is destroyed. We call on all countries to double their efforts to save Ukrainians. Since the start of the war, 113 children have been killed and more than 130 wounded. Hundreds became orphans and refugees. Uh, for the moment, we know about 3 million people who left the country and about six and a half or even today seven million uh, idps in ukraine this is a situation humanitarian situation some uh, only uh, main uh, descriptions of what is going now in ukraine uh, i would stop uh, here and if you have any questions to discuss i would uh, be more than happy to explain and to give a response. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Evgen. It's really heartbreaking and devastating picture you were then painting. Um, may I ask you maybe to explore a little bit the state of negotiations between Ukraine and uh, Russia, um, maybe you can imagine that uh, in the, the German and European public views uh, had been um, absorbed, uh, that maybe there is a chance for a diplomatic solution, maybe we will find a, a political exit uh, from this war. We always had been very skeptical given uh, the aims and, and, and targets of Putin, uh, um, uh, who, who clearly uh, aims to, to destroy Ukraine as a nation and a sovereign state. But can you give us uh, maybe a little bit more information about the state of, of negotiations? Uh, though I'm not uh, a participant of the team, which was formed by uh, the president of Ukraine. Uh, what I know, we received all this information uh, publicly after some statements of the participants and members of Ukrainian delegation. But if you want to know the position of Ukraine um, on these uh, negotiations, I would recommend to read carefully today's statement by the president of Ukraine. He explained in detail what is the purpose of Ukrainian delegation on these negotiations. And then he explained his own position, what he wants to achieve during these negotiations. And that's why uh, due to a very short time of our first part of the panel, I will not go into detail, but I recommend, strongly recommend to read this today's message, a statement of Ukrainian president. Thanks a lot. So we will pass the mic to uh, Michael Siebert. Uh, I already introduced him um, in my like, opening remarks. Um, Mr. Siebert, um, I think this is quite a mixed picture. On the one hand, we heard a lot of um, respect and um, some grateful um, words regarding the support by the European Union for Ukraine. On the other hand, 
um, as far as I know, the European Union imported uh, since the beginning of the war uh, fossil fuels from, from Russia worth around about 15 billion, 15 billion, um, enabling the, the regime um, to, to continue the war. So what is uh, the European Union's um, position now? How, what can we do? What must we do uh, to um, support Ukraine to, to hold and uh, even to um, push back uh, successfully the Russian aggression? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Ralf Fuchs, and very nice to see you from Brussels and you, Marie-Louise Beck, uh, to be back in Berlin for a moment uh, virtually. Um, first of all, um, it is, I mean, I have been dealing with uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, over many years, and it's really heartbreaking to see that uh, what we have to do now uh, these days. and. Uh, um, I would like to join you in, in admiration for the courage uh, of the Ukrainian people. Uh, this is uh, the two really touching uh, feelings you get every night when you watch the news, uh, the, the heartbreaking situation and the outstanding courage uh, of, of uh, people in Ukraine. Um, before I come to, to uh, the, the, the EU response to this terrible situation, I, I would like to spend two minutes to just ask uh, ourselves what it is about, really. Of course, it is about Ukraine, uh, very much so, and most of all, it is about Ukraine. But it is also about the stability and the security of the European continent, as you alluded to in the beginning. And uh, we have to see uh, our cooperation with Ukraine in this perspective. And it is even more, and uh, as the European Union, we try to focus on that as well. It is a, a blatant attempt to change the international order, to change the international peace order, um, it is something that not only has a national and regional uh, significance, but it is, if, if we let uh, Putin uh, go away with um, the uh, uh, use of force uh, in, in such a conflict where a nuclear power, a P5 country attacks a neighboring country uh, without any reason, this is uh, th this would change the international order uh, for good, as the English say, but for worse, of course. And uh, this th we have to mm, continue to make this clear to to nations also beyond Europe. So, what exactly are we doing? Of course, the the main thing now is assistance to Ukraine, and uh, European Union tries to give this assistance throughout many areas. Um, not only the financial assistance that is necessary now that the um, uh, state and the economy are, are under such unprecedented uh, pressure. We are doing it in cooperation with other IFIs and, and institutions, uh, very um, high uh, sums of money in terms of loans and grants. Uh, that has been mentioned already by Ambassador Periligin, uh, partly, but uh, there's much more uh, through many, many donors. Of course, um, there is also the concern to deal with the humanitarian situation, um, to deal with it in Ukraine, and that is uh, what is uh, are our colleagues from ECHO doing very much together with UN organizations to try to bring help to people. And here, I think it's not money, the main question, it's the conditions, it's the situation, as was mentioned, Mario, Mariupol is, is, the, uh, is the image we have uh, uh, deep down in our heads by now and we'll never forget this is the situation that we have to 
to end the soonest possible and to alleviate as much as possible. Um, but uh, similarly, of course, in, in many other uh, less uh, known, known places throughout Ukraine. Then, of course, uh, it is the, the question how we deal with refugees, knowing that most of the refugees are internally displaced and we're trying to help them as well. So many coming to Western Ukraine and uh, uh, the shortage of, uh, of many things there already but also with um, those who cross the border uh, to the EU and also to Moldova. Uh, we've put together a big package to support Moldova with this unprecedented situation in that small and poor country. Uh, and we uh, have been already um, uh, granting uh, entry to the EU for more than 3.5 million Ukrainians in a couple of not even a month. I mean, if, if we for a moment remember 2015, where there was a big debate in Germany about 1 million in a year coming from Syria at the time, now we have three and a half million in a month, and it is about 100,000 a day on top of this. Uh, very quickly, there uh, was the temporary protection mechanism, basically saying that everybody can come in easily and uh, be helped, get the permit to work, etc. I also would like to say that uh, the reaction of our populations, of our citizens in throughout the EU and in Moldova has been uh, enormously uh, positive. And uh, uh, this only makes it possible to absorb as many people in such a short uh, lapse of time. But we have to now look at the midterm perspectives uh, as unfortunately the war is not, not ending uh, very quickly. Um, uh, we have done practical things, for instance, to connect Ukraine to NSOE, to the U European Electricity Network, very important. Uh, uh, this was done uh, last week, uh, just as an example. And of course, we, we have promised to uh, co-finance the reconstruction of the country and uh, would say we would be so happy to be able to do it uh, quick as possible. Next to support to Ukraine and Ukrainians, it is also about isolating Russia. Um, we had a vote in the United Nations General Assembly where 141 nations voted uh, to say that Russia uh, has uh, committed uh, an uh, aggression against Ukraine and only five, including Russia and Belarus, voting against. Uh, this was an outstanding victory, if I may say so, of uh, those who want to underpin the current uh, existing world order. It was very helpful. It was also very helpful that uh, the, the International Court of Justice uh, put out its uh, ruling on 16th of March that uh, Russia has to immediately suspend operations. Not that they would follow it, but it's, it's at least a, a sign that the international community uh, is on Ukrainian side and that uh, this side is the moral uh, one. The same for the International Criminal Court prosecutor who opened end of February an independent investigation. So we have to build on these, uh, on these efforts and to sustain the support of the international community. It, is, it will not be easy uh, because there is a war of narratives also. The, there are quite a few countries, uh, some of them abstained in the United Nations General Ex Assembly, who uh, still want to have uh, relations with us and with uh, Russia, and of course with China that is still behind Russia. <clears throat> we have to talk to these countries. We have to isolate Russia in international institutions. We have done it with quite a few Council of Europe, regional cooperations in the north of Europe and uh, OECD and, and many more. Um, we have to also, and we're doing it, uh, try to help Ukrainians to put together evidence on the crimes that Russians are committing in Ukraine to later on hold them accountable, those who perpetrated them. 
this is very important. There are many, uh, many um, activities to collect evidence, proceed evidence, data, um, and uh, European Union wants to uh, add to this, uh, for instance, with programs to um, raise awareness of the local populations about uh, what is what are war crimes and how should the should the data be collected. Uh, also to train journalists to uh, deal more professionally with this and and many more. But uh, I repeat, the war of narratives is very, very important. Um, and it is, by the way, increasingly difficult to get into Russia and reach Russians because the Russian media space is so much cut off uh, that we have difficulties mm. to, to reach out. Um, one more point, of course, sanctions. Uh, what does it mean? It means to raise the cost for Russia, continuing this. Uh, this uh, illegal war and um, I'm, I'm glad to say that we have already put together the biggest uh, sanctions package uh, ever uh, put on a country with at, uh, at the moment uh, 877 individuals and 62 entities listed, blocked, uh, deprived of their assets in, in Western countries. We have put, of course, um, these uh, uh, sanctions on political leaders, including Putin, on business leaders, so-called oligarchs and their families, uh, on military leaders and on propagandists uh, that uh, uh, pursue this war of information. And of course, there are financial uh, question uh, sanctions, um, the uh, de-swifting of, of um, most of the important Russian banks, the uh, blocking of uh, one half of the um, foreign currency and gold reserves of Russia, uh, limitations to exports, especially in uh, areas where uh, the European Union can deliver um, goods that Russia cannot easily provide in other parts of the world, for instance, specific material for uh, um, drilling for fossil fuels, etc. Uh, Russia has been deprived uh, of the most favored uh, nation uh, clause in, in trade. Uh, the transport sector has been hit uh, with the European airspace being blocked, etc, uh, etc. Et and um, I would like to end with one, um, one area we are now working on very much. Uh, which is also um, at least indirectly linked to, to this war, the European Union will try to uh, phase out its imports of fossil fuels from Russia much, much quicker than we had foreseen. I don't have to tell the, this more uh, mostly German audience about Nord Stream 2, but uh, this will go much beyond. And uh, we will look at uh, not only the German government, as I, as, as I heard, uh, but also the European Union try to, to phase out uh, the huge part of their imports in fossil fuels from Russia. And this again is uh, of course, something that uh, should be of concern to Putin and uh, that would help hopefully help to uh, come to a point where uh, a ceasefire, first of all, that is so necessary can be reached and then uh, serious negotiations uh, on, on the basis of Ukraine's legitimate position and aspirations. I'm very much open to questions. Thank you. So thanks a lot, Michael Siebert. Um, are there any questions and comments um, on the two inputs we have heard up to now? Um, if not, I would like uh, Ivana, Ivana Klimpo. Ivana, I, 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 I see you, Ivana, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
Ralph, thank you, Michael, thank you, Maria Louise, for, for, for having this discussion. And uh, I hope that the possibility to, to address the audience, but in the meantime, I'd like to, to ask a very concrete question. What are your expectations with regard to this EU summit? that is upcoming and uh, specifically my question is so uh, what is it <clears throat> what are the expectations with regard to embargo on um, Russian oil and gas um, taken as a decision on this summit specifically uh, with regard to the uh, position that Hungarian government is holding at this particular moment because here at least in Ukraine uh, there are clear signs that um, it's coming not only from Germany, <clears throat> the, the opposition to this embargo, but also from Hungary and also the, uh, obviously that's probably not a question to you, but I have also some other questions with regard to the upcoming NATO summit, but that's probably for another discussion. Mr. Zibet, please. Yeah, thank you for the question, Ivana. I, I hope I have got it because it, there's sometimes an interruption of uh, two, three seconds. So I hope I got the gist of it on the question of uh, potential uh, sanctioning of uh, fossil fuel imports from Russia. Uh, having assisted to the Foreign Affairs Council yesterday, I can uh, tell you that it is a question under discussion amongst uh, the member states of the EU. I, I would not uh, point to specific member states and I uh, think it is uh, more than you mentioned uh, in numbers uh, than, uh, than um, uh, the ones you mentioned. It is, okay. uh, it is a question that has to be looked at uh, at this point. Uh, many, uh, almost uh, anybody agrees on that, but uh, it has to be looked at, uh, and this was uh, also coming up in the debate uh, from different perspectives. Um, there is, of course, uh, the immediate effect uh, uh, that is hoped for from uh, depriving uh, Russia uh, from this uh, substantial income that is uh, used to, to finance the war. But on the other side, um, there are uh, also, uh, we would have to see how, how it really could work, because oil especially is something that you can also sell to, to other parts of the world. So if it is not sold to the EU, it may be sold to others. It will automatically, of course, rise the prices so that in the end, uh, Putin could even have a gain from such a measure because he will get even more for, for his oil. That is, uh, is also some opinion that has been mentioned less in, uh, in the debate. Um, so I cannot uh, look into the glass bowl and tell you uh, what the European leaders will decide. Uh, uh, we have seen in recent weeks that uh, history went very quickly and that decisions that uh, seemed um, improbable yesterday uh, were uh, decided uh, two days later. So um, we just have to wait how the discussion goes, and this, of course, will also depend, I, I presume, on the situation on the ground. Thanks a lot. Of course, um, the urgent question is how long can Ukraine wait? Um, you, you mentioned, Mr. Siebert, um, quite an impressive list of um, support and uh, sanctions by the European Union. And it's true the the sanction up to now decided um, are unprecedented. But at the same time, there's the flip side in it. If you're looking um, to uh, the effects on the, the Russian economy, the Russian foreign currency, reserves are rising, rising, not declining, because of the enormous uh, revenues they are uh, drawing from oil and uh, gas exports. And Europe is the main customer for these um, land exports. And this allows them, because uh, Sparebank and Gazprom Bank and others are excluded from the uh, financial sanctions, this 
allows them to do business, yeah, to import uh, crucial uh, technologies uh, and, and, and goods. Uh, they need to, to, to run their economy and to continue the war. Um, so I would say we are undermining our own sanction policies with the exemption on the energy sector and um, beyond uh, arms supplies, uh, this is the main leverage we, we have up to now. So, of course, it's on, on the national governments and not just I wanted the, to say, yes, this commission. is, of course, this is, of course, uh, the, the, the argument of uh, quite a few member states uh, uh, that was uh, discussed very much uh, at, at, at the last Foreign Affairs Council and will, of course, be discussed at European Council later this week. So other uh, question and comments? Otherwise, we would move to uh, the second uh, part of our conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Yevgen uh, and uh, Mr. Siebert. Up to now, you will uh, join us also for, for the next part of our discussion. Um, and I would like uh, to then invite uh, Ivana Klimpusch um, to give us an, an, an opening a statement on what the EU and the national governments in Europe, especially the German one, can do beyond uh, financial and humanitarian aid and uh, the political um, instruments we, we already uh, have uh, applied. So what is your expectation in terms of political, military, uh, than economic uh, action. I see that you have hand wanted to maybe refer to, to the previous section. Is that right? If maybe Just a like... second, someone muted me. Yevgen, uh, if you if you want to respond, please uh, feel free and then we will move to Ivana. Thank you very much. I uh, do not want to respond. I would like to make one point. You asked uh, about the position of Ukrainian delegation and Ukraine on the negotiations. And I sent to your secretariat or to the secretariat of our meeting in English, the official paper of the views of the president on Ukraine on these negotiations about ultimatum from Russia, about the end of war, his interesting and very, very important views. That's why I ask the secretariat, it's in English, to circulate among all the participants. Thank you. Yeah, we got it. So, Ivana, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, you know, this is the, today the third meeting uh, that I participate in and some of the things that I am raising, obviously, I will be uh, repeating. So I'm sorry if you've heard me speaking on some other occasions, even today. Uh, definitely, Ukraine is right now in the middle of the most brutal, uh, bloodiest um, war that has been waged by one state against another one, totally unprovoked. King Lee um, after the Second World War. And uh, Ukrainians are suffering from the brutal shelling, uh, pounding of our cities, killing of the civilians. As we were talking right now, I just read the news that father of the uh, of 14 children was just killed in front of his apartment, in front of his house, even though by a Russian occupier, even though he was saying he doesn't have a weapon, he was trying just to protect his children from the occupiers and such stories this um, are unfortunately uh, scaling up on the whole territory of Ukraine and uh, we believe that with um, you know with trying to erase our cities from the map of the world trying to to um, to, to ensure that they are destroyed that our uh, nation does not exist Putin is committing genocide against Ukrainian people and I that's why I think it is right now for the whole world to decide uh, on for, for each state, for each politician, for each nation and each society to decide on which side they are, either the side of light or the side of, of darkness and evil. Obviously, Ukraine 
Ukraine does need the financial and economic resources to be helped to, to get out from this abyss that we have been pushed in uh, by the Russian Federation. According to the IMF, uh, the, the projections at this particular moment are that uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, GDP will be dropped by 35% by the end of the by the year, and um, at this particular moment, near, nearly 60% of our exports are at um, under threat. You have to understand that agriculture and metallurgy these are one of the, the couple of major major uh, sectors of our of our exports, and while Russia has blocked the uh, access to the uh, Azov Sea has blocked access to uh, ports um, in the in the Black Sea has blocked access to and and is mining the territories um, uh, on near the Kerch Strait. We have no real ways to uh, export whatever we we still have the some of the um, some of the plants uh, uh, plants as you have probably heard, have been totally destroyed in Mariupol, which is being just at, at this particular moment, the, the city is like 80 to 90 percent destroyed by the Russian uh, Russian troops. And that's exactly what they want to do with the uh, with our country as such as, and with our nation as such. So therefore, we definitely need the humanitarian assistance. That's one of the things that, that we need. And uh, this is not only about products, about uh, food, about um, medicine or hygiene products or, and so on. Uh, but this is first and foremost, the assistance with the regard to humanitarian corridors to get people out from the siege cities, from the bombarded cities and so on. I cannot be, um, I cannot proudly tell you that international humanitarian organizations are doing their best at this particular moment. I think that they are underperforming, um, even though they have a mandate to help and, and provide assistance. And that's uh, that refers to UN, that refers to ICRC. And I am saddened by the fact that how much money was poured into these organizations and this they or, these organizations are not present um, to the extent we would expect them uh, to see them on the ground in such a situation, in such war that is ongoing right now in, this, in Ukraine. With regard to our losses, we do not know the exact number of losses uh, of civilian casualties. And that is because we cannot get access to some of the cities and towns and villages that have been under occupation or have been under shelling. So uh, when UN is um, coming up with uh, numbers of, of uh, 2,000 people, that does not have anything to do with the reality. Yevhen has uh, referred to 113 people, uh, children who died. That's already not the right uh, number. It's already 117 children that is that are confirmed, that, whose death is confirmed. So the death toll is just growing every single day. I'm not even going to tell you about the number of residential buildings, of the schools, of kindergartens, of hospitals that have been ruined and damaged, so totally in violation of all the rules of war and engagement, uh, in violation of all the Geneva Conventions, we have uh, seen attacks uh, by totally prohibited weapons. In the violation of any Geneva Conventions, we are seeing our mayors, our local officials, our journalists, our activists, our paramedics being taken hostage and brutally tortured. One of them being, uh, you have heard about mayor of, uh, of Melitopol, I'm sure I'm very glad that he has been freed, but there are others who are still kept hostage. Um, quite a few of uh, paramedics and one friend of ours, uh, uh, paramedic Taira Yulia Payevska, along with a couple of other uh, paramedics who have been helping in Mariupol, are held hostage. And right now, uh, Russian NTV is uh, showing um, video with her asking, uh, asking uh, to, to kind of stop shelling in, in Mariupol. I know what this lady had to go through in order to to, um, to record that video. So um, the situation is dire and it is scaling up. And unfortunately it is escalating and Putin does not need an invitation to escalate. He does not need a direct 
clash with the uh, NATO planes in order to escalate, not exclusively to the territory of Ukraine, but actually escalate to the territories of other countries. And if we do not stop him in our own on our territory, of Ukrainian territory, on Ukrainian territory, he will spill this war over to other nations and other regions. He is already involving other nations in this war against Ukraine, like Belarus, like Armenia, like uh, getting um, getting fighters from Syria to come and, and uh, fight against Ukrainians. So it is already scaling up to the to the um, to 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 come out of um, the war between two states, and I think that this has to be paid attention to. But first and foremost, besides financial aid, besides humanitarian aid, besides um, besides other things, we need to two major things. We need something that sounds still very, um, very strangely, probably, and very idealistically to many in the West. That is a no-fly zone, and no-fly zone can be arranged if not with the support of our partners. Um, then it could be arranged by real, serious, long-range air defense and. Uh, fighter jets that could be transferred over to Ukraine so that Ukrainians would arrange for the no-fly zone over our no own countries, specifically over the humanitarian corridor, specifically over the nuclear power plants that are under control of Russian Federation, specifically over our cultural, cultural heritage sites, um, and so on. And that is something that could be done. We need massive, massive weaponry um, income, uh, inflow to Ukraine. Uh, and it's not only about the decisions being made and the promises being made and declarations being made. It's about urgent delivery, it, not only to Ukrainian border, but us taking it further to, to the places where it is needed. And that is about everything from what I've stated to basic nutrition to bullets to bulletproof vests and, and, um, and um, helmets for our soldiers and those many thousands, hundreds, thousands of Ukrainians that have been involved in the territorial defense trying to, to engage and protect their country. Um, with regard to sanctions, um, thank you, Ralph, for actually pointing out to, uh, to in this previous part of the conversation that, yes, it's unacceptable that uh, European Union right now is sponsoring Russian war against Ukraine by its money, by via buying um, fossil fuels in the uh, in the Russian Federation, and I do understand that it's not that easy to kind of uh, cut off all the uh, imports in, at one moment. But I think that unprecedented times do require unprecedented decisions and do require difficult decisions that would probably even economically hurt uh, European societies, but they could preserve European societies from the destruction and war and, and loss of life. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case with, uh, with Ukraine. I heard today one of the um, German MPs speaking at another occasion who said that, that he is sorry that uh, Germany didn't listen to us when we were saying that Nord Stream 2 is a um, geopolitical weapon, this is not, and this was never about economics and so on. It's good to understand right now, but act further. It's not only Nord Stream 2 that has, has to be finally blocked. I actually admire uh, politicians in uh, parliaments of uh, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, the small countries of and brave countries who understand and realistic countries who really understand what they are we, what we are standing up against that they have called with their decisions on the no-fly zone. I think others could follow their path. Sanctions should be enhanced and should be made more com comprehensive. So embargo on oil and gas, that's one thing. Thank you for, for mentioning other Sberbank, um, Gazprom Bank. They have to be under SWIFT. It's good that the European Union is, sanction, is sanctioning some 800 plus um, officials and uh, bureaucrats and, and uh, oligarchs go after their families. None of their children, none of their families has to have safe heaven in any of your countries across the board. They should not, enjoy, they should go and enjoy their life in Siberia. They should go in and praise Russia back in Rostov, back in St. Petersburg, back, back in Russia, and there enjoy this Ruski Mir that is coming to our cities, coming to our towns, looting every single house and home that they are coming to and killing our people right here. The, 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 the 
the cruelty, the brutality, the barbarian behavior of this armed forces is just unspeakable. And we are living every single day under shelling, under stress, under psychological, physical uh, destruction. And we are calling on all three nations to actually um, take the responsibility, stand up to, to, to the challenge and act militarily, act sanction-wise economically, and also act by giving us a prospect for not only having the right to live, but also having the light, right for the future. And I am saddened by the fact that it takes so long for the European nations to actually take their act together and give us the candidate status of the EU member for Ukraine. I think that we should have been given map already today. I think that we should have been given uh, candidate status to the EU already today. That means a future. That means that those people who are losing their lives, protecting something that you said all these years that you believed in, you were saying never again, it is happening right now. We, should, we cannot um, accept that. So I'm calling on all people who have the consciousness, who, who know the history, who want to see their future being prosperous, uh, developed, democratic, to help Ukraine today. This way, you are saving yourselves because uh, our only guilt in front of Russia is that we want it to be free, we want it to be um, democratic, we want it to be part of the European Union, we wanted to be part of the transatlantic community, we wanted to have a choice. And this choice is being taken from us. But right now, it's the choice between the life and death. And we are not going to give up neither on our territories or on our, um, on our ability to choose our path. We will fight till the very last person and very last bullet. But you have the possibility to help us not to lose every person that is ready to fight against Russian Federation. It's in your powers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivana, also for raising this sense of urgency. And uh, sometimes we have the impression that we are still too much in our comfort zone in the European Union and in, in Germany. Um, given the dimension of the humanitarian catastrophe which is uh, unfolding in Ukraine, but also the political challenge we are facing. Michael Siebert had been speaking about it. Um, the whole European order is um, at, 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 at risk and uh, if, if Putin succeeds in Ukraine, he will not stop in Ukraine. So it's our interest, it's our duty. Yeah? And um, thank you very much for, for your words. There, there, there are already a lot of uh, questions. Um, in the uh, chat room, the question and answer section, we will try to, to come back and to refer to this question in the course of our then conversation. Um, I would now like to invite you, Vitrenko, uh, if you are you already back, yes, I can see you, um, for your uh, statement and uh, then we will move um, to uh, the German and the European side, um, members of parliament, uh, members of the commission, Marie-Louise Beck, um, to respond. Um, please, Juri. Juri Vitrenko, the CEO of Naftagaz. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak uh, at this event. Uh, Ivana uh, already provided uh, uh, the horrors uh, or described the horrors of this war. And uh, while our brave military and ordinary citizens are defending uh, our country in this barbaric invasion, 
my job and uh, the job of uh, many uh, colleagues of mine at Naftagas uh, is to um, provide uh, some critical supplies uh, to Ukrainians. Uh, we're talking about gas, uh, heating, um, oil products, uh, uh, something that uh, is important for tens of millions of, uh, of Ukrainians while we are at this war. Um, uh, just to remind, uh, about 90% of Ukrainian uh, homes uh, depend on gas uh, for heating. Uh, it's still minus degree at night uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and in many cities uh, uh, in Ukraine, uh, a week ago it was minus 20 uh, at night. Um, unfortunately, uh, in some of the rather big cities like in Mariupol, uh, for weeks people are left uh, without uh, gas heating and some basic uh, critical supplies. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, there is nothing we can do about that. Uh, so in many uh, places in Ukraine, our employees go on the bullets and repair the infrastructure. Uh, but in some cities, uh, the, uh, the infrastructure is so damaged uh, that there is nothing we can do and the people are left there uh, basically in the humanitarian uh, catastrophe. Uh, but but for others again it's still our job and we're still able to provide uh, heating gas uh, uh, so that they can still uh, leave um, as far as I understand the topic of, uh, of this event um, is uh, what can be done uh, in order to stop the war uh, but also uh, to help uh, uh, Ukrainians who are suffering from the horrors of this war. Uh, in order to stop the war, and we're all interested uh, in stopping this war, um, because again, millions uh, are, are, are suffering from, from this uh, horrific war. Um, it's obvious that uh, uh, what has been done is not enough to stop Putin, so we need to do more. Um, it applies uh, to sanctions as well. Uh, uh, however painful uh, they can be even for uh, those countries who are imposing these uh, sanctions. Uh, we do understand that unfortunately, uh, Europe depends on Russian gas and oil, uh, but uh, revenues from Russian gas and oil um, are uh, the most important source of money uh, for Putin that he spends on uh, his uh, military machine, uh, but also on building uh, something. I don't want to go to into okay. too much of politics, but it's more or less obvious that uh, what he's building, unfortunately, is basically Russian Nazism. And uh, that is why it's really important for everybody just to deprive him of financial resources um, that he is using again uh, to build this um, Russian Nazism. Um, there are different ways uh, how to do that, uh, starting from outright embargo on uh, uh, Russian oil and gas. Um, yes, again, as I say, it will be painful for Europe. Uh, prices will go up, uh, but uh, it's it's not that critical as some of the German politicians or European politicians uh, try to position it. So with a combination of energy efficiency measures, uh, uh, use of alternative uh, sources of energy like coal, uh, nuclear, again, renewables, uh, uh, Europe will be okay without Russian gas, even though, again, prices will be a little bit higher. Uh, or even significantly higher, but still, again, uh, it's not the same when uh, if millions are uh, refugees and uh, tens of thousands of people are, are uh, dying, and we all understand that Putin will not stop in Ukraine. Um, but then the reason um, uh, a, a less um, uh, difficult mechanism for Europe uh, is uh, 
to use so-called escrow accounts uh, and to say that uh, uh, all the revenues from uh, uh, Russian oil and gas can go only on these accounts. And uh, Putin will be able to access these accounts only when he withdraws uh, from Ukraine. Um, yes, there is a risk that uh, they will uh, not uh, send Russian gas and oil to Europe if they cannot access money immediately. But it's not that simple to stop all the flows because uh, as the CEO of a gas company, I can say that when you're producing gas uh, uh, and you have a producing well, you cannot just shut it down. So you need to flare this gas basically just to burn it or to do something with this gas. So chances are that Putin will be still sending gas and oil uh, uh, to Europe, even though he is not getting this money immediately and this money uh, is put on this escrow account. Um, so that's at least uh, uh, that the minimum basically that Europe should do is just to say that uh, Putin cannot get money from oil and gas. Uh, uh, all the money should go uh, on this uh, escrow uh, account. Um, it will change the calculus of uh, Putin uh, and it will uh, speed up any peace talks uh, that uh, we are holding now. So that's something that we would need urgently uh, to stop the war. Um, second, uh, now if we look at the humanitarian side, uh, of course we are thankful uh, to everybody who is helping uh, Ukrainians. Uh, it's really very important uh, uh, for Ukrainians, but I also believe uh, for those who are helping to show their human side and to show that uh, it's really uh, a common uh, problem, it's a common challenge, and we feel this kind of solidarity with ordinary people all over the world. Um, so it's something that is very important for us. Um, but we should not forget that uh, uh, humanitarian assistance uh, includes not just, for example, taking care of refugees, although it's very important. Uh, it's not about sending some uh, food or medicine to Ukraine. It's also very important. Uh, but uh, tens of millions of Ukrainians are still here and they need, uh, uh, for example, as I said, they need heating, they need electricity. Uh, they need gas that they use uh, to cook. Uh, so um, many of Ukrainians cannot uh, pay now for, for electricity, for gas, for heating. Uh, infrastructure is damaged, so it's uh, much more expensive to maintain this infrastructure. But we need to do it despite the fact that, that uh, uh, customers are not paying. And that is why uh, we have already started uh, uh, talking to our international partners uh, about some financial assistance uh, to the uh, uh, utility sector in Ukraine mm. uh, so that uh, Ukrainians can get, uh, still can get access to critical um, uh, utilities uh, in Ukraine, like electricity again, like heating, like, like uh, gas. Um, that's something that uh, requires uh, engagement from uh, international partners um, and uh, that's something that uh, should be discussed in, in much more details and much more intensive. Um, I would probably conclude and then I'm open uh, for questions um, that uh, uh, it's obvious that it was a big mistake of Germany uh, to uh, do Nord Stream 2. So just to remind, Nord Stream 2 construction was started in 2015 15. after the invasion uh, of Putin into Donbass and Crimea. And uh, now, at least with benefit of hindsight, we have to recognize that it encouraged uh, Putin because Putin uh, uh, thought that uh, it's probably the best sign for him that the West and Germany would accept his uh, aggressive uh, uh, policies, uh, his uh, uh, invasions into independent countries, uh, uh, would still partner with him, uh, basically no matter what he does. So uh, 
Again, you may say that he misinterpreted uh, uh, the intentions of the German government. Uh, for sure, again, I have no doubt that, uh, again, uh, uh, it was not uh, uh, an intention of uh, Merkel's government to uh, tell Putin that he should or can invade other countries. It was the opposite. Uh, that's clear. And again, I personally discussed it with uh, the previous chancellor. Uh, but still, again, uh, it was probably uh, a miscalculation, by the way, not all, for, only from the German side. It was also a miscalculation from the US side uh, to delegate uh, uh, this security dimension to Germany in the first place. So instead of uh, taking care of confronting Putin, in 2014. That's something that the US could do and had to do. So when you delegate to uh, Germany uh, this security dimension, uh, of course, again, uh, it's not that easy for Germany to confront Putin, for example, militarily. But back to uh, Nord Stream uh, um, projects. So it was an obvious mistake to do Nord Stream 2. It sent the very wrong signal to Putin. Uh, but now, uh, because he uh, has already waged this aggressive uh, uh, and barbaric war, uh, we have to uh, look at Nord Stream 1. What I mean that Nord Stream 1 should be sanctioned. And uh, uh, it should be clear to Putin that if he wants to uh, continue sending gas uh, to Europe, it can be done only through Ukraine. So, and it's not because we want this money. Frankly, again, uh, uh, for me personally, every time uh, I even think about this bloody Russian money, uh, uh, sorry for the uh, clock, uh, but uh, it's something that, uh, okay, I have to be diplomatic. So we would not like to touch this money, but it's not about money, that's the, po that's the problem. The point is that uh, as long as, uh, uh, this gas co goes through Ukraine, it's still a deterrent, basically, for more atrocities, for more uh, um, bombing or shelling of, of Ukraine. And it also uh, sends the right signal to Putin that there is some kind of solidarity on the Western side, and that uh, uh, the West will is basically telling Putin that, look, uh, if you want to continue at least uh, somehow trading with us, uh, um, you have uh, to stop this war and you have to make sure that Ukraine uh, uh, is uh, uh, an independent uh, uh, state that is not completely ruined. So that's why I believe that this question of sanctioning Nord Stream 2 uh, should be very high um, uh, on the agenda. Nord Stream 1. Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 1, yes, sorry, Nord Stream 1. Um, and uh, just to conclude, again, at least my personal experience uh, of uh, negotiating with Putin, dealing with Putin, making him uh, do what is necessary to do. And uh, just to remind everybody, in 2019, uh, um, I participated in, in the meeting, um, this Normandy uh, format meeting. Uh, and then at the end of this meeting, we had bilateral negotiations uh, with Russia. Uh, at the end, we had uh, these negotiations about uh, the gas issues, and from the Ukrainian side, I was leading these negotiations. Uh, and on the Russian side, it was not Miller or Novak who were present at the room, but it was Putin who was negotiating uh, basically with me directly about the payment uh, uh, from the Stockholm arbitration, $3 billion, and continuation of, of the transit. Um, so my learning from these negotiations uh, and in, from dealing with Putin in general was very simple. Uh, he recognizes uh, only strengths. Uh, there is nothing about this kind of reciprocity concept or so win-win solutions. Uh, uh, he doesn't care about that. Uh, so he cares uh, only some very, again, primitive uh, uh, calculus when you say that, look, you will lose more if you do this, and we will make you lose more if you do this. So if you don't want uh, to lose this, uh, you have to do this. That's the only language that uh, he understands. Thanks a lot, Yuri. Um, maybe one specific and brief question to you. As far as 
I understood um, you are not advocating for a total uh, embargo against the Russian uh, natural gas exports, but to a selected um, focused on uh, Nord Stream 1. Uh, what is, in, in your view, about the argument we frequently hear also in Germany in our debate that a complete um, a total import ban on, on Russian gas would also hurt Ukraine? I am advocating for the full embargo. Don't take me wrong. Okay. Uh, what I'm saying that if uh, Europe believes that currently it's not ready for a full embargo, and then at least uh, there should be these escrow accounts. So Europe should at least uh, find the strength to tell Putin that he's not getting money out of these exports until uh, he uh, withdraws from Ukraine. With this trusty account, yeah. Uh, yes. And then, for example, if he withdraws from Ukraine, so he gets this money, but then Europe says, but still basically as a punishment uh, for what you have already done, uh, we're sanction we sanctioning Nord Stream 1. And then uh, we have to make sure that uh, this gas uh, goes uh, through Ukraine uh, so that you yeah. understand that next time uh, you think about invading Ukraine, uh, you will uh, understand uh, the consequences. But in general, I believe that Europe uh, uh, should do everything necessary not to depend on Russian gas and oil and not to uh, have any kind of need to import uh, Russian gas and oil. And I, I, I hear this argument that, again, but Chinese will import Russian gas and oil. First of all, it takes years, if not decades, to build new pipes and uh, they don't have uh, technologies for that. Uh, to build pipes uh, from the fields that are currently used to export gas to Europe uh, to take this gas to China. And then economically it makes uh, no sense. But then good luck to Russians to deal uh, with Chinese. And then you see, I want to see them, I want to see Russian Nazism uh, targeted against uh, China. I want to see it, you see. So China will explain to Russian Nazis basically uh, uh, what they will do with that. Uh, but back to your question about Ukraine. So. Again, yes, transit revenue is very important for Ukraine. We're talking about roughly $2 billion, 1% uh, of our GDP. But as I say, it cannot be compared to the damage that we see at the moment, and especially, again, human lives. You cannot put a sticker, um, a monetary sticker on, on human lives. So from that perspective, again, any economic price we have to pay uh, so that, uh, again, we can stay as independent country and we can keep as many Ukrainians alive as possible, we're ready to pay any price for that. Thanks a lot for this clarification. Um, we'll now move uh, to um, the responses and comments uh, from the German and the EU perspective. If I... Um, looking at the, the chat and also rethinking uh, the um previous contributions we we already heard uh, that clearly we have three clusters of uh, discussion and potential some differences we have to um debate uh, the first one is uh, the sanctions uh, package uh, to extend it on the russian energy sector there are different proposals um, in the on, on on the table the second is uh, the ukrainian um, request uh, on um, no fly zone there is another um, variant of uh, this um, uh, the concept of an humanitarian no-fly zone over parts of Ukraine for protecting uh, internally displaced uh, people and allowing humanitarian uh, support. And if no no-fly zone, what are the alternatives uh, to prevent uh, Russian Air Force from uh, bombing uh, cities? And uh, the third uh, main area of uh, discussion is um, the EU 
uh, membership uh, perspective of uh, Ukraine and a, a clear, a very clear statement from the EU that um, we will not agree to leave Ukraine as a kind of buffer zone or uh, an eternal uh, part of the Russian sphere of influence. No, it will be about the European integration of uh, then Ukraine. So maybe the comments can focus on these uh, three uh, issues. We're still around about 40 minutes. Uh, so please um, be not too long so that we have still room for some question and answers. We will start with um, Johannes Schraps, member of uh, parliament, um, and member of the SPD, the Social Democratic Party in Germany. Please, uh, Johannes. Yeah, thank you, Ralf, and thank you, marie Louise, as well, for organizing today's uh, event. I think it's, it's very much necessary um, to have these kind of discussions because uh, every idea and every creative thought, uh, how we can uh, shape the things that we have already done and uh, to take a, take, a, take a look into uh, what we still can do or what we still have to do uh, is very much necessary, I think. Uh, so thank you for organizing uh, today's event. And perhaps uh, let me say it's, it's hard to, to, to comment on everything that has already been said because there were a lot of points. I will try to do uh, as brief as possible on, on a few of them. And let me say it's, it's very good to see you, Ivana, and also to hear your appeals and your reports uh, also from Yuri and from uh, Evgen uh, and the others, because I think it's, it's necessary as well, um, because these reports and appeals, they shape the discussion also uh, here in Germany and ho hopefully not just the discussions and the debates, uh, but also the actions uh, um, of the European Union uh, that uh, follow up uh, the, the debate that we currently have. But uh, I mean, it's, it's clearly a turning point in history that we've seen with the start of this war. Um, because I mean, this, uh, this war, which is against international law, it, it's uh, the first time since over 80 years that we have uh, um, a country uh, with such an ag a huge aggression against an, a, free, a peaceful neighbor um, that we have seen since Second World War. And I mean, that's something, especially for us in Germany, that is burned into our German identity. Um, that uh, the things that happened uh, in the Second World War are something uh, that we always have in mind in all our actions and all our discussions that we have. And I think um, there, are, there are a few points that Ralf already mentioned um, that we have to take into account. And I mean, it's about Ukraine. It's a, it's a country that is really struggling for sheer existence. And uh, seeing so many people dying, the, the killed civilians and the loss of lives, but also the destructions uh, that we see, it's something that is uh, sad and very painful to see also from, from uh, the German perspective. And I mean, we've met, uh, I think it was in 2019, Ivana, when uh, I was together with Frank Schwabe uh, in Ukraine um, in person. and. Uh, it doesn't need to be uh, that we have been in Ukraine and knowing the country that it's sad and painful to see what happens uh, there at the moment. And um, I mean, it's the fact that, that Ukraine has so far held its own against uh, this murderous uh, war uh, of aggression is also, or let's say, um, mostly due to the, to the bravery of its, its defenders at the moment. And, also for these defenders, we have to do everything we can do to support uh, Ukraine and especially the defenders that are fighting there at the moment. So I think it's three things. It's first of all, we have to think about um, how can we deliver more weapons to uh, Ukraine? Um, how can we do more as we did till now? Because I mean, we have sent weapons to Ukraine, but from my point of view, by far not enough. And actually, um, Marie Louise makes the sign that it's uh, it's uh, quite quite small. And I think uh, if we take into account that this equipment of the German army uh, is obviously so inadequate uh, that the German that the German contribution to the NATO arms deliveries has so far been let's say comparative, comparatively modest, um, we have to think about how we can do more there. 
And if we can't uh, deliver more weapons because we don't have them or whatever, I think it's necessary to um, deliver at least financial uh, support so that uh, Ukraine can uh, buy uh, more weapons on themselves. But also there we, we have to know, we have to take into account that these weapons won't be built overnight. They have to, they have to be sent to Ukraine, and uh, it's it's meant it's been mentioned in the in the chat as well. Um, we have to make clear that also the deliveries reach um, the defenders uh, that they are able to use the, these weapons. But I think it's necessary there uh, to make them able to to buy their the weapons on their own if we can deliver more on our own. Second thing I think uh, that should be uh, a very important thing is humanitarian aid. But that's a very difficult thing if you don't have, or if you have an aggressor that doesn't give anything uh, on, on rules and uh, also rules that we gave each other um, in the event of war, it's very hard to, to deliver humanitarian aid in, uh, in a way that is necessary um, at the moment. But, Nevertheless, we have to find ways there how we can uh, deliver more humanitarian aid. Third thing, uh, the, the, the no-fly zone. I think that is a very difficult one. I think it has to be an aim to create such a no-fly zone. And I think it's very important. Uh, that's why I say this. It, uh, it, it really, uh, nothing should be ruled out if it's a good idea uh, to implement this, and that it's necessary um, that the Russians can't use their um, um, their overweight uh, in, in the military uh, with planes and, uh, and with rockets, we have to break this somehow. But nevertheless, it's important to think about how to implement such an no-fly zone because someone has to make sure that such an in instrument works. And we also have a responsibility and I say that in a very diplomatic way, we have a responsibility to not trigger an escalation of the war that goes far beyond the war that we already have and that we already have to see every day. So a direct confrontation of NATO and Russia is a thing that somehow we have to, um, um, to avoid. And actually very clearly the, 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 the Americans have made clear that they will avoid this uh, direct confrontation. So that is very hard to implement such no-fly zone without triggering such a direct confrontation. Just mentioning this because it's, I think it's very difficult to implement this because a no-fly zone doesn't stop at the border between Russia and Ukraine. It has to be implemented also to a certain territory of the Russian Federation if it should work. And that's something we have just, we have to take into account. No, nevertheless, I think it's something we have to think about how we could implement it. And perhaps the last thing, and uh, then I come to an end, uh, the question of an embargo. I think that's also something that we have to have on the list. It has to be an aim that we need to reach as quick as possible. Also there, it's something that can't be implemented overnight because we have to think about the second, the third, and the fourth, and the fifth step afterwards as well, and the impact that it has. And I mean, not the impact that it has on, I don't know, on, on Russia and uh, its, uh, its currency flows, and or the financial uh, flows, but also the other way around. And I think that is necessary because also the sanctions, and that is the last part, the sanctions that we, already implemented. We have to, uh, after these four packages, and uh, Michael Siebert already said a lot about this, and I don't want to get into details there, um, after these few packages that we already have implemented, we have to make sure that they are effective. And therefore, we have to close loopholes that are still there in certain areas. Um, and we have to, to see that these, uh, these sanctions uh, are really in place and that they work. And we have to take take care that we have we can shape uh, shape these sanctions in the areas where they don't work yet, so that we put more pressure on the Russian regime. And perhaps uh, because I don't want to get too long, the last sentence. I think 
I would like to remind us uh, to something that, that didn't got into the discussion yet, because from my point of view, also R Russia just has a perspective for the future, if this war quickly comes to an end. Yeah. And that's something we have to make clear also to the Russians, because they are isolated and they will still be isolated if this war comes to an end. And I think that's something we have to make clear. Perhaps that's that's the first comment uh, from my side. I, the others would like to comment as well, but uh, it's necessary to do more as we already did. Thank you very much, Johannes, for this very open-minded statement. I would uh, like now to uh, pass to, to Robin Wagner. He's uh, the spokesperson for Eastern Central Eastern Europe for the uh, green fraction in the parliament. Robin, I think when the Greens entered the coalition, they didn't expect to be in the center of the storm with both ministries, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Economy and Climate are now directly dealing with uh, this war. So what is your comment, please? Yeah, I think no one expected that, although we had the signs that it could have happened. And um, yeah. unfortunately, um, on this side of the Atlantic Ocean, we took the wrong conclusions from all the things we saw um, in the reports. Uh, that's a very common mistake we all made in Europe, unfortunately. But now we are in this situation. And um, yeah, let me answer some of the questions. First of all, the first question I would like to, to answer is, uh, will we leave Ukraine as a buffer state? And um, I would say definitely not because it is not up to us to decide what is going to happen there because um, war is about a sovereign Ukraine and it's not the, the, the ability of the European Union, the United States of America or whomever to decide what is going to happen with, the, with Ukraine and, and which kind of an agreement can be made. Um, but then taking this question even further, do I want Ukraine as a buffer state? Definitely not, because this war is fought for European ideals, it's fought for democracy, freedom, uh, rule of law and things like that. And it started in 2014 when people in Ukraine went up and stood up for um, taking their steps towards European Union, which was something that Vladimir Putin could not accept in his neighborhood because he's in fear of freedom and democracy. That is what this war is about. And so we have to be very clear uh, if we are a European Union based on values and if we want to do a value-based foreign policy on that, we have to be very clear that we have open arms for Ukraine and we want them to be part of the family. And that is what I said in, in a parliament session. I said that uh, one day we will have the day that uh, people from Ukraine will represent their country in the European Parliament. Uh, and I think that should be the aim that this day will come. Um, and it's very important to have a very strong statement on that and a very strong commitment of the whole Union towards this cause. Um, I think we should not concentrate so much on the, the formal steps on that. Uh, at the moment, um, the, the application is there. The application is within the European Commission. The European Commission has to make the, the, um, the remarks for that and the recommendation, and then the states will have to act on that. But personally, I'm, I'm very much in favor of um, going as quick as we can on these steps. Um, but that is the formal procedure. The most important thing, I think, is to be very clear that we want Ukraine to be part of the European family and um, the family of, of uh, democracy, freedom and rule of law uh, and not of some kind of, of imperial construct of, of uh, spheres of influence or whatever is in Vladimir Putin's mind. Um, was Nord Stream 2 a mistake? Definitely it was a mistake. That was one of the questions and definitely it was. Um, we as Greens said that uh, years before it was a mistake to do so and it never was just a a private economical project. It was a geostrategically and um, ecologically wrong project to do that. And um, it's good that finally um, we have this, um, uh, this, this common position in German politics that Nord Stream 2 was definitely not a good idea. And it was not a good idea. And, and, and uh, it was a, even more a mistake that we um, have not taken further steps towards um, energy independence in Germany years before. 
because now we are in a very bad position at the moment, but we cannot we, we cannot choose which is the, the position from where we start at the moment. We are in a very bad position at the moment. Have we done enough to secure a free and dem democratic and sovereign Ukraine? No, we have not done enough. And I said that in Parliament uh, last week when we had a debate on that. We have not done enough, obviously, because the war is still going on and Vladimir Putin has not been stopped yet. So what we have to do is um, do what the Parliament uh, decided on uh, three weeks before um, to every day um, try to find stronger sanctions, deliver more weapons, uh, deliver human and humanitarian aid, economical aid and financial aid to make Ukraine able to buy weapons for themselves. All these steps have to be taken every day, um, but also within when I'm coming to the energy sanctions, unfortunately, uh, we are talking about quite a long period that we will have to take the energy sanctions. I'm personally very much in favor of having the strongest possible energy sanctions that we still can apply for quite a long time without uh, having to push back ourselves from these energy sanctions. So I'm, I'm very grateful to Robert Habeck that he's uh, at the moment uh, traveling around trying to um, get other energy sources for Germany to make us faster energy independent from Russia to be able to go to uh, boycott of the, the energy supplies. And I think it's very important to um, how he does it because um, we cannot do it just with a what's the English term with a wide west or whatever because we have to buy the energy somewhere and it's not it's, it's not the best uh, the best place to buy it in, in Qatar for example the energy but it's even it's better to buy it in a, in, the, in the regime of Qatar than from the um, uh, war loving dictator and, and war criminal uh, in, in Russia. So we have to take these steps and decrease them even more uh, to be more energy independent as fast as we can in order to apply more energy sanctions. And personally, I would like to um, to find out if it's possible, um, if, if closure of Nord Stream 2 is not possible at the moment at once, perhaps Stream 1. We can, uh, Nord Stream 1. Um, I'm talking about Nord Stream 1, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, if it's not possible to, to close it, um, at once, perhaps we can reduce the amount of gas that comes through, through it and, and have more gas um, through Ukraine, Ukrainian pipelines, for example, that could be an idea. I'm not an energy expert, but uh, I think we should have a look on that if, if these steps are possible. In the gray... as, far, as far as I get it, uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, represents about, I mean, Nord Stream 1 represents about 50% of the Russian gas um, exports to the European Union. Yeah, so it would be a partial step. Yeah, of course, a partial step. I'm not talking about the best, uh, the, the best possible yeah, yeah, I world understand where fully. we can live in. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about the, the gray world of uh, real world solutions that we have to find yeah. uh, and that I'm very unhappy about. I'm, I'm not happy to live in this gray world where we are. Actually, I'm feeling ashamed every day but unfortunately this is the world where we live in and this is the world where we woke up and we have to do as much as we can as good as we can and for example we have to find as much weapons as we can to deliver them to ukraine on a safe way deliver them and then uh, hand them over to ukraine um, also to to enable ukraine to um to to get more control over the airspace um because I don't think that we will find a way for a, um, a flight control zone imposed by NATO in Ukraine without having a direct war between Russia and NATO, because we would have to shoot down Russian planes if we do that. And we will have to shoot down Russian um, air control in Russia and Belarus if we would do that. But we should, we should do as much as we can to find weapons to supply them to Ukraine in order to help Ukraine to defend themselves. Um, and I'm really urging my government to do as much as we can on these steps. And I'm, I'm very unhappy because uh, definitely it will never be enough. But we have to do as much as we can in this gray world that we are living in. Thanks a lot, Robin, also for these honest um, and open remarks. Uh, our two final uh, speakers now. Um, Boris Yarochevich, uh, he's uh, the senior advisor to um, Michael Siebert in uh, the uh, European External Action Service. Um, 
please feel free for short remarks. Yes, thank you very much for giving me the floor. It's extremely uh, useful for me. I was attending another event this morning and uh, being sure that we are working day and night uh, to, to help Ukraine. And uh, we are also grateful for all ideas that have been expressed today. <clears throat> of course, uh, a lot uh, has to be decided by the EU member states, by, by our political masters, uh, but uh, let's, let's, uh, let's be ensured that we will continue uh, to provide a wide range support to, to Ukraine. And here uh, I'm talking about the EU institutions, commission, but also the member states, also a number of international financial institutions, EBRD, EIB. So we are not, not alone there to, to help you, uh, to help Ukraine in these difficult, extremely difficult moments. We will continue to work on the restrictive measures, on sanctions, and uh, we are working on the fifth package. Um, there are still discussions, as, as it was said, about uh, oil, gas, and coal sector, what to do there. But uh, I think I've heard very, very interesting ideas today. Um, and we will, we will be ready to, to, to impose more sanctions, uh, of course. And I think uh, uh, <clears throat> that, that will uh, most probably happen, as we don't see, unfortunately, any de-escalation on, on the ground, on the contrary. Uh, I would like also to, to stress that we will continue to isolate uh, Russia in the international fora um, and to hold Russia account. I think Michael Siebert already presented uh, ideas, but we are working with all like-minded and I think we are on the same line with our G7 partners, with Norway, Switzerland, many other countries to, uh, to, to make uh, Russia pay a uh, high cost for, for this uh, invasion. And we will continue to work in the uh, UN uh, fora, for instance. Uh, we are working to and outreaching uh, all third countries to, to support the Ukraine sponsored uh, resolution, UNGA resolution on, on, on the humanitarian situation. And we will continue to support Ukraine in that respect. So, um, be ensure that we we do all our best to 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 support uh, to support Ukraine uh, in uh, full uh, unity in full solidarity also with uh, uh, with uh, with the people of Ukraine. I would like also to mention two other countries, uh, Moldova and Georgia, which. Uh, uh, were affected by the war, Georgia, in 2008, and that was maybe the first uh, warning call for, for us that uh, things were uh, getting uh, bad. Uh, and as you know, um, Georgia was facing a war uh, against uh, Russia and lost 20% uh, of its territory. Nowadays, Moldova could be also a target uh, of, um, of Russia. So we also uh, have uh, are demonstrated a lot of solidarity with these two countries. And uh, both have also applied to the EU uh, membership. And I think both, uh, both and together with Ukraine have a European perspective. And I must say, even if the process of uh, getting uh, getting EU membership is long. I think the fact that we have recognized uh, the EU aspirations of, of uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and the Republic of Moldova, I think it's a big step. It's a big change in the European policy, I must say. So overall, I think we will uh, listen, continue to listen to you, and uh, we will continue to, to act to uh, stop this war, to have uh, an end uh, uh, of the hostilities and uh, in order to have uh, Russian troops and equipment leaving the whole territory of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yaucevich. And um, now I would like to invite Marie-Louise and Marie-Louise back um, to provide her remarks, please, Marie. Thank you. I want to make a few nasty remarks which might not amuse you. I think it's a little bit my role in Germany at the moment. Uh, number one is uh, politics 
uh, is very eager to repeat again and again that this is Putin's war and not Russia's war. I understand why we want to show the Russian population that we have open doors if they want to return. We want to tell them that we will be friends and wanted to be friends with them. But um, if you listen to Ivana and she's telling stories like she did with those, uh, this father which was being killed in front of his children, uh, this is ordinary Russians doing it. So I think you must say, yes, there is a Russian population that has been uh, in a hybrid propaganda situation for years. But of course, this is also a war which would not be possible if Russian fighters would not behave as they do behave. And this is something I think you have to talk about. And uh, we have now a new international law which gives the possibilities within individual countries to have trials against war crimes. And uh, there is people preparing that in Germany. And this is something which will not be against Putin. It will, it will be not against Shoigu. It will be against individual responsible commanders. Number two is uh, talking about humanitarian aid. Uh, it is true if you look at many, many, many people in Germany who are really um, uh, heartwarming, engaged, opening their homes for people, trying to help and so on, going to the railway station, picking up refugees. This is a good side, but it cannot, and especially not politics, it cannot keep us from facing and answering the more critical questions, which are not being about good, but about talking about evil things, which is military interventions, military supplies, and so on. And uh, this is a debate Germany does not like. <laughs> uh, which is a sympathetic side because it says, well, some people have learned out of our history, but this never again has a second side. And this is what about the victims? And what if somebody asks, and now it is Putin does not listen to this never again. So <clears throat> then it is about signs, signs and weapons. Johann has, Johannes has been very outspoken on that. I will take the signs. There is knowledge that wars can be won even by those who are uh, uh, not as good military equipped as the aggressor by the mere uh, conviction that they are fighting for a good cause and that they are fighting for their country. And I think for that, this sign with the candidacy status uh, for Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova is so important. The people now fighting, and many of them are not regular soldiers. They are free. They have their free decision. They need moral signs, which we can give. And this is about candidacy. And then I want to raise, then of course, these weapons. And it is a shame that our government waited so long and had to be pushed by public media to finally move. And what they are deliver, de delivering seems to be old stuff. This is really something which you cannot explain to those people fighting in Ukraine with their own bodies. About the no-fly zone. We have in our team many, many people from Ukraine. Of course, for them, this was one of the most um, logic questions uh, and, and requests to do. I do take serious that 
giving Putin the chance <coughs> uh, that he can claim that NATO went into a direct confrontation is really a decision which takes up a lot of responsibility. But I want to bring up another argument. We know that Putin has been lying constantly and he has no shame about propaganda. If it is true that he is as aggressive as he is and as cold-blooded as he is and that he's decided to win and that he might get even more and more aggressive if he sees that he's losing this war. But we don't want him to win, not only because of Ukraine, because people, some people start understanding that it might even be about us, Georgia, Moldova, anyway, but then the Baltic states and then about us. Now, if we give all those good weapons which Ivana was talking about, plus planes, you said, which are necessary. What if Putin then realizes that he is losing the war? Will he not immediately claim that he, that Ukraine is losing that war because NATO has stepped in? We, you have to go through it logically. And I don't have an immediate answer. I just tell you, don't be so sure if NATO stays away with decisions like that and just hands over good military supply, which in the end will leading to a defeat of Putin, that he will not construct out of it that NATO has been intervening from its side. So we do have a problem anyway. And one more idea. Um, you, Ivana, were talking just like that about genocide, that this is a genocidal war. I have to admit, if from what I understand about international law, and if you take Mariupol, all the signs are there that it is being genocide in Mariupol. We have started this debate in Germany by two professors of international law. Nobody takes up this debate. I can understand why. Because if we would have a public debate in parliament in this week, where is the, the budget debate? that there is genocide being committed two hours away within Europe in, in our closest direction. And we are letting it happen. This makes us feel more unstable, uncomfortable and pushes more towards more action. This is very clear. And I think this is why I understand why this genocide debate seems to be a taboo. I think, look at it. Don't make a taboo out of it because it's about responsibility. And if it turns out that we have this genocide, not only in Mariupol, but in Kharkiv and then other cities, I think the West will be, to a certain extent, destroyed also, because then claiming that value, it's about values, the West will be destroyed also. Thank you. Thanks a lot for these uncomfortable questions. Uh, we have only a few minutes uh, left. Um, maybe um, we could focus on a critical point um, Marie-Louise already raised um, concerning arms supply for Ukraine. Lavrov already some days ago publicly declared that um, 
convoys with uh, military aid for then Ukraine are legitimate targets for the Russian military. So are there any scenarios how to respond if Russia would uh, attack um, military um, arms uh, and transports, um, maybe even in the territory, uh, territory of um, Poland or Romania, or if they would attack airports, which now are um, working as a hub for, for military aid. So what do we do if uh, the Kremlin decides to escalate the war? Who wants to respond? Um, may I? Yuri. Yeah, please. please um, I probably, I'm younger than uh, Putin, uh, but I have experience uh, from um, uh, times uh, that probably influenced uh, Putin a lot. Uh, and uh, that to a large extent, uh, uh, outlined the mentality of uh, some Russian mainstream, let's call it like this. Uh, so, um, because after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, uh, there was a lot of violence in the street and uh, law enforcement was very weak. Um, I was a young kid. Uh, I, I was a football player in some youth academy, uh, but then I had to do something else and I did some amateur boxing, something like that. So, um, but my point is very simple, is that uh, I have some experience of being like street, street smart or to have some street fights, because that's something that was inevitable um, in, in the so-called 90s um, in, in Ukraine and in Russia. And in this uh, street fights, uh, uh, again, you can be, uh, I mean, it's, it's cruel again, it's violent. There's nothing good about the street fights. It's not about some noble cause or whatever. So, um, sometimes you have to just, again, uh, to have this smug feeling of superiority over a neighboring block by beating people or something like that, or they would have, uh, uh, they would be willing to get the smug feeling up because of beating, for example, like me or people like me from my district. Uh, but my message is very simple, is that, uh, when you have these fights uh, and then somebody else is coming, like again, a policeman or even some, some adults uh, or somebody who can interfere into this fight. Um, usually it's a very good excuse uh, for a person uh, who initiated this fight to stop this fight. Because then you can always say, look, uh, I'm still superior because before somebody interfering, interfered, I was winning this fight. Uh, but then I stopped this fight, not because I was weaker, but just because uh, somebody interfered. So it lets you uh, save the face. So my point is that if uh, NATO somehow steps in, although in a smart way, like for example, no flight zone that Ivana mentioned, or some peacekeeping operation, uh, something on the territory uh, on the Ukraine that is not directly targeting Russia. It's not like, for example, an airstrike on the Russian territory. And then it would be a good excuse for Putin uh, mm -hmm. to uh, step back and to say, look, uh, we demilitarized uh, Ukraine, uh, we are stronger than Ukraine, and we achieved all our objectives uh, inside Ukraine. But then, look, NATO stepped in. We don't want a third world war. That's why uh, now we are withdrawing the troops. So I just cannot imagine why Putin would uh, like having a confrontation uh, with uh, the NATO bloc when he has a lot of military difficulties, uh, even in Ukraine. So that is why, of course, again, it's, it's a hypothesis. So there are many other uh, options and, and there are many risks. Uh, uh, but uh, from this perspective, from a kind of understanding the mentality of, of these people, I think that in fact uh, it can be not so uh, risky a uh, move. But even if it is a risky move, the problem, and the, here you probably have, uh, I would even dare to say, some kind of historic uh, responsibility. You know how Nazism starts and how it ends. 
And that's why I believe that the historic responsibility of Germany is not about helping Russia. Uh, it's about stopping Nazism everywhere in the world. And unfortunately, what we see in Russia at the moment is that Putin is fueling this smug feeling of superiority of Russians just because they belong to the Russian nation. And then they, they, they have this right to subjugate other nations. You see, to say what other nations can do or denounce the rights of other nations even to exist. So if Putin is not stopped, then this uh, Russian Nazism will grow to a problem that, uh, again, you know yourself what happens uh, to Nazi states and how ugly it can be. Thanks a lot, Ivana. Maybe a final remark from you. Yes, just a couple of, uh, of words. Um, I don't agree with everything that uh, Yuri has said at this particular uh, intervention, uh, only with the last part, because I do not think that, uh, that Putin will stop and, and I don't think that Putin needs any chance to preserve his face. I've heard about, uh, these claims by many negotiators over the years since 2014, when delegations have been coming, knocking on my doors as the Deputy Prime Minister then, saying, you know, what, we have this idea, how we conduct a dialogue with Russia, so, and we will offer Putin how to save uh, face. It doesn't work with this. We have been saying with this leader and with the Russian people. And I'm very grateful, Marie-Louise, that you have said that it's not Putin that is uh, fighting this war against us. And that is something that definitely didn't resonate with uh, Ukrainian hearts and minds when we heard Olaf Scholz saying that it's only Putin who has to be blamed on this war. According to some, some uh, estimates and, and polls, uh, more than 70% of Russians do support this war against Ukrainians uh, that Putin is fighting right now. So it's, it's much more to that. Um, to, to the, it, this is Russian terrorists say to, that is, that is uh, fighting this war against us. So they do not understand language of negotiations. We should not try to assess their, their actions from the common sense, from the logic, from the part of logic, from the part of ratio. This is beyond that. And that's why our actions, and they could be only common actions, Ukrainian and the free world actions, um, should be about serious punch, so, should be about unity, and should be about strength. When this guy uh, and this nation would be, will be punched, will sit back, will be defeated, they will understand. After that, we can talk to them. And that's probably the only way we can get out of this war at this particular moment. Otherwise, this war will definitely. Do you want that? Or do you not want that? Um, he will escalate. He will escalate further beyond Ukraine. We have been telling you about Nord Stream 2. Now you admit that, um, yes, that was a mistake. We have been telling you about logic of Putin's actions for, for eight years. Now you understand that we were right. You have been misreading um, intelligence that was presented by the US and, and Britain. And, and now you say, okay, we were coming to the wrong conclusions. Come to the right conclusions finally and act. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ivana. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, I think you made the perfect conclusion of this conversation that Putin has to fail in Ukraine with his war policy and his neo imperial and revanchist ambitions. Um, that this war is also a test on our, on the German and European capacity to catch up with this historical challenge and our willingness to act even if it takes 
a lot of courage and also a certain degree of maybe even sacrifice. Yeah. And this is nothing compared to um, the suffering of Ukraine, the suffering of Ukrainian people, and compared to the courage of uh, Ukraine as a nation fighting for their independence and freedom. And this is an obligation for us. So whatever the political conclusions then concretely are, I think we, we are still um, not at the level it needs um, to, to answer this uh, the historical challenge. Thank you very much all to you for this, I think, very serious um, discussion. This is not an academic uh, exercise. It is about action here and now. And every day counts. The longer we delay, the higher the price in human lives and uh, destruction the Ukraine will pay. So I hope very much there, there will be some um, impulses uh, from this uh, discussion today. And we will do everything. This is a message to our Ukrainian friends to support you and uh, to continue our cooperation in a better future. Thank you very much, all to you. And um, yeah, we will see us again. Thank Thanks you. A lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, for us, we count by minutes, days, uh, minutes, hours, and days, not anymore in, in weeks to yeah. months. So that matters. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Take care. Take care.